as we uh, continue in this, um, I, am I am rejoicing about um, the fact that Jose is being used in our lives to teach us much about the great glory of who God is and our need for Him. Uh, you notice this with me, the uh, title of it is Face It, Three to One, Judgment to Mercy. What in the world does that mean? Well, as we look and as we see through the message of Hosea, we come to find that indeed there is a tremendous message of judgment. In fact, we're going to see here in just a couple of moments as we look at the Levitical law and as we look at the Mosaic uh, covenant that God has with us, that there are numerous, numerous statements of judgment for pulling away from the Mosaic covenant. But by God's grace, there are also very, very, very powerful statements of His mercy. And so this morning as we come, um, I want you to maybe, I have not put this in the outline, but in that space above there, I just make some note of this, of this type um, above the review and background. Here's, the, here's, here's what I want you to get. If we will face the message of Hosea, if we will face the message of Hosea, we will be stronger, we will be deeper, and we will be more joyful as Christians. If we face the message of Hosea, we will be stronger, we will be deeper, and we will even be more joyful. Now, you, you would say, well, wait a minute, I've already read through this a little bit, and I've heard a few, a few Sundays of messages, and there's lots of judgment, there's lots of hardship, there's lots of rebellion mentioned here, and it doesn't sound like things are about to go well for the nation of Israel. What in the world does this mean? My friends, we need the whole counsel of God's Word. And when we have the whole counsel of God's Word, we can come to see God as who He really is, not really an idol God that we have made by our picking and choosing through the Scripture. And so, this morning we come to this glorious passage that helps us see again who God is. One of the great things that we see in Hosea is that we're reminded of God's great righteousness. For those of you who are new to us this morning, um, or for Tommy and Caitlin who haven't been here, um, as they are moving along here, we, we want to bring everybody up to speed on where we are. Let's recognize here in our, in our review and background, the context, this will help you. We've said, number one, Hosea was a prophet to which kingdom? Which kingdom? Very good, the northern kingdom, the northern kingdom of Israel, and so otherwise known as Ephraim or Ephraim. Um, and he was prophesying to them beginning around 750 BC, somewhere around there. He began prophesying to them, and he would prophesy to them for 40 years. And as he would preach to them, his life, both his wife and his children, were a living illustration of Israel's unfaithfulness to God. So we see here that, that even his wife that he is told to go marry, you can go read chapter 1, 2, and 3, he's going to marry a promiscuous woman, and that is going to be an illustration to the nation of Israel that God is a faithful God, like Hosea was faithful, but Gomer is unfaithful to Hosea, and that is the picture of what Israel has done against God, being unfaithful to him. Number three is new to us just a little bit. I want you to see this. I'm unpacking this. And what we look at in number three with A and B is going to set up the rest for us to make it out of here by 6 p.m. tonight. So I just want you to see this. I want you to see this real fast as we go. Letter A is this. There's two messages that are being preached by Hosea, two very important messages. Letter A is how and why God's people may expect to be punished by a variety of disasters soon. 
So here's the picture. There are a variety of disasters that, are, that he is proclaiming are coming upon them, and here is why they can expect that. He's explaining the fact that this is coming, and, it, and, and I'm telling you the reason it's coming, nation. Hosea is saying to the, to the nation of Israel, you have rebelled against God. You have left your God. You don't know God. You've sinned against God, and how... This is what is about to happen. So his judgment is coming, and Hosea had the wonderful task of telling a nation of people um, that judgment is coming. But there's another message, and skip down. Letter B you see there is how and why, this is the other message he is teaching, how and why God's people may expect to be rescued and restored eventually. So the first one is this immediate thing that judgment is coming. It cannot be avoided. You have done this, and the, and the, the enemies are on the way. The pestilence is on the way. The disaster is on the way. It is coming. It may not be here yet, but I can guarantee you that it's coming. That's what he's saying, and that's going to happen soon. And so you can circle the word soon up there under, at the end of letter A, but at the end of letter B, we see the word eventually. And it's because they're not going to be restored right away. There's going to be a time of hardship. And, and we need to begin to see how God is dealing with Israel because we can learn a lot from what he is doing with Israel. And we learn a lot about who he is. And we learn a lot about the sin nature of humanity and even the people that are to be his people as they rebel against God. So let's go back up to underneath letter A. It's the Mosaic Covenant. Fill that in, the word Mosaic. That means it comes from who? Moses. So this is the Mosaic Covenant. God makes a covenant through the Mosaic Law in this, between God and Israel, given, and this is, this is when this is given, or, or the books that it's given, is primarily in, in Leviticus, but we would say Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and then it's all repeated in Deuteronomy. So here we have the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and that's called the Torah. That's called the Law. And in this, we see God's covenant, his Mosaic covenant, being played out to the nation of Israel. Look at the next part here. God, in his righteous justice, he will, and in fact, he must, fill that in, he must keep his covenant commitment. When there is a covenant, there is both the opportunity to keep that covenant by a very positive measure of, of the blessings that are involved with the covenant, but there's also the possibility of judgment. And so when the covenant is broken or when the covenant is not being abided by, then there is a promised judgment. Now, this is very important, Sheridan Hills. We've got to understand. You won't understand Hosea if you don't understand that what Hosea is saying is coming from the Mosaic Covenant. They were told all through Leviticus, and they were told all through De Deuteronomy, if you do these things, there's going to be blessings. If you don't do these things, or if you turn away from your God, there is going to be judgment. And so God is simply delivering on his end of the covenant. And so they turn away from God. And this is, this is how we're able to come to see the faithfulness of God, the holiness of God, the righteousness of God, and the need of humanity. But we see it being played out with God and the nation of Israel. Notice the next part. There are specific offenses and there are specific judgments. And as we said, they're coming soon. And so as you read through Hosea and you go, wow, I just, man, there's so much, I, I don't quite understand how in the world. I want you to know that as we, and we're not taking the time to do this because we would make, we might finish by the year 2025 if we did. If we started going through each verse and pointing back to the passages in Leviticus and pointing back to the passages in Deuteronomy, we would, it would take quite a long time for us to unpack everything that Hosea is pointing to from 700 years earlier in the law being given. Notice here with me, there are specific offenses, but there are also 27, fill this in, there are 27 covenant curses in the Mosaic law. 
And this simply means that as you go back and you look through Leviticus and Deuteronomy specifically, God is saying, if you break this covenant, if you don't do what we have established for you to do, what I've instructed you to do, these things are going to happen. And there's 27 um, of these things that are listed out. If you look through both of these renditions of the law, you will find that, that, and and here's the type of judgment, here's the type of curse that will be on there. You see there, God's anger, rejection, war, invasion, exile, captivity, drought, famine, illness— You see, it's in part, this is how we see that God is very serious about his holiness and our holiness. We begin to see that God is very serious about sin. And so if we we hadn't seen that, we would not know much about this God. In Leviticus 27 and verse 6, it says, I will set my face against you. A few verses later, it says, I myself will be hostile toward you. A few minutes, a few verses later in Leviticus 26, it says, in my anger, I will be hostile toward you. So we begin to see that this isn't just a great big God floating around on the clouds with a big beard and says, "I, I hope you love me. I love you. This is the creator God over all of creation, whom we have sinned and rebelled against, and he is bringing the opportunity for us to know him. And he is coming, and he's revealing his salvation plan century after century, millennia after millennia. He is revealing to us our need and his goodness. So Hosea is worth the fight. Hosea is worth the study. Notice here with me, much of Hosea's message is referring to these curses directly or indirectly. So when you read certain things that are going to happen, when you read certain pronouncements that are coming against them, you're not only seeing the sins that they have done in breaking the Leviticus law and breaking the Deuteronomic law, but we also see the judgment or the consequences of that. Look at letter B. We're not just left with the disasters that are soon to come for them, but we also see that God in his grace and in his mercy is saying, I am going to bring you back to me. I am going to restore you. I'm going to rescue you. So notice this, God in his mercy and love is going to redeem and heal his people. God is going to redeem and heal his people. There are 10 covenant restoration blessings in the Mosaic law, at least 10, depending on how you designate them. There could be more of them, but these are the pictures of, I'm going to come back to you. I'm going to heal you. I'm going to turn your heart to me. I'm going to restore your land. I'm going to restore your fortune. I am going to restore what has been taken because of your disobedience. So we're beginning to see how God deals with Israel. And we're beginning to see, listen to this, the heart of God, that even though he's going to judge and he's going to punish, he is also going to come and heal. Now, some of you would say, well, I don't like that. I just like the heal part. Life is hard enough. Why doesn't he just come? Well, listen, the picture is, is that we have a holy God that calls us to come and walk in him. So we need to see how holy he is. We need to see his intention, and we need to see what he would do, the lengths to which he would go to rescue us and to bring us back. So that's why I say if we study Hosea and if we take a little bit of time here and a few weeks here to really look at this message, we will wind up becoming stronger, deeper, more joyful Christians as we stand in amazement of not only who God is, but what he would do for us to bring us to himself. And so Hosea starts to help us to see that. And this morning as we fly through these chapters, you're going to see all of this, that there are judgments and there are are sins listed, but we're also going to see one of these threads of hope. I want you to see the next part. These eschatological or future promises, blessings, restorations, and hope are coming. They are on their way. He is saying to them that they are going to be in the future. 
They're not going to be now. It's not that you're going to be spared from the judgment that is to come, he's saying to the people of Israel, but he's saying, in the future, you're going to see who God is. Now, some of that is played out in some of their lifetimes. Some of their, there is some healing. There is some restoration that is there. There is some mercy. There is some coming back to Israel after being carried away as captives. But most of the picture here ultimately is what God is going to do in the great restoration of eternity. We begin to see that there is this grander picture of his salvation in all things. So, fill this in. There is a small but crucial thread of hope that runs through Hosea's prophecy. In fact, you could say that it runs through every single one of the prophets of the Old Testament. You will see and hear a lot of judgment. Why? Because there is a lot of very good. Some of you are there. There's a lot of judgment because there is a lot of sin. And when we see that, we could, we could lose hope, except that our God is saying, no, 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 wait a minute. I have woven a thread of hope through all of this so you can ultimately see my purposes, but you have to understand who I am and what you have become in your sin. Now, if you would, just you notice there, there are, these, there are these passages under that last bullet point, Hosea 2, 1 through 3, 2, 16 through 25, 3, 5, 6, 1 through 3, Hosea 10, 10 and verse 12, circle that one. We're going to see that one in just a few moments. Hebrews 11, Hebrews 14, especially the end of the, the last chapter. Most sermons that you hear are based on those right there because those are the threads of hope. Those are the ones that are beautifully promising of God's redemption and his hope. And so most pulpits, if they're going to spend any time in Hosea, they spend time writing those hope passages because that's what we want to hear. But if we ignore the megaphone of saying, you have sinned against God, we don't see properly who God is. We don't see properly how he redeems his people. It, it goes back to what one of my seminary professors, Dr. Gray Allison, he died about four or five weeks ago uh, in, the, in his 90s, but he used to look at us, and some of you have heard me say this before, when he said that you're presenting the gospel to people, you, he, he would look at us and he'd say, he was from Louisiana. I think I said that right, Louisiana. He, he, he used to say, boys, you got to get them lost before you can get them saved. Now, what does he mean by that? Except that they have to see their sin and their need. They have to see their, their condition before God and the reason why Jesus would come and go to such extreme measure to die on the cross. And that's part of what we see is that the judgment passages are showing us our need and they are also showing us in the hope passages, the thread of hope, God's grace through every single one of the prophets of the Old Testament. I look at number four right there, and I've added a few of these from um, previous um, statements here, so just kind of fill these in. Look at number four. Hosea's message to Israel is extremely valuable to today's church. This does matter to us. We do need to see this. Letter A is this. We see God's what? His long-suffering nature. God is patient even when we are persistently rebellious, even when his people that have a covenant with him are persistently rebellious, Hosea will show you that God is long-suffering. Look at letter B. We see our spiritual adultery in Israel's spiritual adultery. Now, Hosea is about Israel's sins. Hosea is specifically a picture and a story that we can see about God's people in the Old Testament, Israel, that has been marked out to be God's people, but yet have not been God's people in their behavior. And we start to see that not all of them are God's people. We start to see that there is rebellious. There are people who do not honor him and do not follow him. And we start to see the great adultery that they have against God going out after other gods. Whenever you see the adultery there, it is primarily speaking of going out to other gods. Let us see, and this is important, this is a new one, we see the seriousness of sin and rebellion against God. 
And my friends, we need to know that in 2019. It's easy to gloss over the idea of our sin. We can wink at our sin. We can think, ah, oh, it's not that big a deal. If we don't see how God dealt with Achan, if we don't see how God dealt with Judah and how God dealt with the characters of the Old Testament, we will miss how serious he is about our sin and our rebellion. Look at letter D. We see the slippery slope of sin. The fact that when you start doing certain things, you get on a path that is very slick and you can slide to depths that you had no idea were right around the corner or right down the hill. So when we begin to, to see the message of Hosea, we see how they get carried off in their sin. And you can be carried off in your sin. We've said often here in the life of our church that we have this statement. It comes from Derek Cox in Oklahoma. This is the first time I ever heard him say it. It just stuck in my mind. But he said, sin will make you stupid. Sin will make you do stupid things. I mean, there's a YouTube videos full of it. I mean, you can look, look at what this stupid person did in their sin and in, in, in their foolishness. Or you can go down to the courthouse. And you can hear the stories, or you can meet with anyone. I mean, you can meet with all kinds of people, and you can sit down, and you can, or you can sit down with your family members, and you can talk about things that have happened in the past, and you can just see that sin makes us do stupid things. Sin carries us off and makes us foolish. This isn't on your outline. This is for free. Sins of omission, that means when you omit doing things that you should do, Sins of omission lead to sins of commission. And here's the idea of that. If you stop doing what you should do, you will start doing what you shouldn't do. If you're faithful to be in worship, if you're faithful to be in fellowship, if you're faithful to be walking with God in prayer and in Bible reading and with Christian believers around you, encouraging you along the way, it's far more likely that you're going to do the things that are right and honoring God. But when you start to slip away from worship, when you start to slip away from your Christian disciplines of Bible reading and prayer and the, the serving that God is in, it's interesting how other things start to flow to the top. And before very long, a sin stronghold has been established in your life. And very often, though uh, either in our marriages we see it, or in our, in our disciplines of our, of our work life we see it, or in our parenting we see it, or in various other things, we just begin to slip further and further and further away from God's design and his plan as we neglect what we should do. So it's this slippery slope that we see Israel sliding down to the point where they are worshiping other gods, to the point where they, they seek to run back to God and yet they, he is not there because they have sinned against him and there is judgment to come. Letter E, we see the wooing power. You remember that word, the wooing power? This is the romantic power passionate wooing power of the bridegroom's love, Christ to the church. This is, this is Christ loving the church. Whenever you hear the bridegroom, that's talking about Jesus. Whenever you hear about the bride of Christ, that's talking about the church. Here is where the bridegroom lays down his life for the church. And we see his wooing love, his caring love in Hosea. Letter F, we see why joyful submission to God makes complete sense. In this little book, we see all of this. And this morning, we're going to see this again, that it just doesn't make sense for us to run away from God and to go after other gods. So look there at the bottom of your outline there. So why do we have a three-to-one judgment and mercy? When you look at Leviticus and Deuteronomy, and you see all of these judgments that are, that are prescribed, 27 judgments, and only 10 of these. I, why, why is this such a big problem? Why do we have such what would seem like an imbalance in this? I think John Calvin hit it on the head when he said this. John Calvin said, the human heart is an idol factory. Our hearts, our fallen hearts are an idol factory. Every one of us from our mother's womb is an expert in inventing idols. We can come up with all kinds of idols. And so what we begin to see 
in this and what we begin to see in the Mosaic law is that that sin has to be dealt with. And that's exactly what brings us eventually to the gospel and the power of the gospel. I want you to see chapter 8 with me, and I want to run through the outline on the right, and then we will read it, and then we will run through um, the next outline, and then we will read it, and then we will run through the next one, and we will read it, and you're going to be amazed at how fast we go. So warm up your pen, take it, rub it in your hands there, get it warm. Here we go. I want you to see, as we read it in just a moment, these things. In verse 1, you're going to see the judgment is coming. You say, newsflash. I mean, haven't we been hearing that for um, a little bit all through these last few weeks? Yes. But here we see it again. Judgment is coming. It is a repeating theme. And why? Because they, we see here, they transgressed my covenant. They rebelled against my law. So, the enemy is going to come and pursue them. So, we see that judgment is coming, and that is the enemy that is coming after them. Um, And so, God has a plan to bring about a punishment that ultimately is going to bring him glory. Look at number two. They are genuinely self-deceived. They do not know God, but they think they do. Ooh. They are self-deceived. They think they know God, but they don't. Letter three, verse three. We're going to see that they have rejected righteousness, underline it, with contempt. They have said, it's not only that we're not going to do the right thing, we're really not going to do the right thing. And we're going to enjoy not doing the right thing. We're going to enjoy doing the wrong thing. They rejoice over their sin. Letter verses 4 through 6, we're going to see they traded God for men and idols. They had God, but then they trade God wanting princes, wanting kings, wanting leaders, and even idols and other gods. You see, skip down there, this is stupid This is completely stupid. God is much better. By the way, young kids in here, it's okay to use stupid every now and then. I know some of you, somebody came to me and said, Pastor, you say stupid sometimes, and I'm trying to keep my kids. They're not supposed to say stupid. Well, that's fine as long as it's not stupid. And (laughs) sin will make you stupid. I mean, it's just foolish. And so I, I want you to see this. It's just stupid for us to think that something's better than God. And God is ticked off. Fill that in. God is ticked off. In fact, God is going to smash the idols. God is going to smash the idolatry. God is not going to put up with it because he is a good and righteous God. In verses 7 through 10, we see in this section that their life is going to pay dearly. They are going to, this, is, this has a very high consequence. It's going to be stormer, stormy. They are going to be unproductive. Anything good that comes along, it's going to get stolen. And fill it in. There's no more special treatment. They lose their VIP status. They're going to become like all the other nations. In fact, their hired friends won't save them. You see, they're going out after other rescues other than God. And they're thinking that this is going to work. And ultimately, what's the bottom one there? Their schemes will what? Their schemes are going to fail. And then in verses 11 through 14, we see the great implosion of their self-destruction. We see that their sin leads to more sin. That sin leads to their blindness. They don't even see their problem anymore. God rejects their sacrificial offerings. So they they seek to go, oh, let's make it up with God. And he's rejecting that. God remembers their sins. That comes specifically out of Leviticus. In numerous places it says that I will remember your sins. You say, well, wait a minute. Aren't there a lot of passages about God forgetting your sins? Yes, But those passages mean nothing unless we see that his judgment is real. And we see how he works to bring about redemption of him coming to forget their sins. Here, he is remembering their sins and he is punishing their sins. And he puts them back into bondage. And they forget God and they seek alternate shelter. And fill it in, God destroys their silly schemes for security. Okay, so I use silly instead of stupid. 
Um, if that helps mom a little bit, that's good. Or dad, feel better about that. But, 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 but we want to see them for what they are. We want to see that it's dumb. We want to see that sin is never, ever worth it. So let's read these 14 verses, and I want you to keep in mind, start up there at the top in verse 1 over there, over the, where we just went, judgment is coming, notice the notes again, they're self-deceived, they have contempt, they choose men in, in idols, see all these, they're going to pay dearly, they implode, let's now see it in the text, and we're just going to go very quick. Look at verse 1, set the trumpet to your lips, set the shofar to your lips, one like a vulture is over the house of the Lord. So here is this vulture flying around over the house of the Lord. And this wouldn't be Jerusalem, this would be Samaria and the, and the, the people of Israel, but the, the, they've got trouble coming. Because they have transgressed my covenant, underline that, they have transgressed my covenant. Notice it does not say that they have annulled my covenant. This isn't an annulled marriage, this is a violated marriage, this is an adulterated marriage. And so, because they have transgressed my covenant and rebelled against my law, we see both key words, covenant and law. And we see that these two things are working together for God's purposes. And so, notice what they say in verse 2. To me, they cry. Notice what they cry. In fact, let's read out, let's read what they cry. To me, they cry, my God, we Israel know you. Hmm. Now, isn't verse 2 very interesting? They say, what are you talking about? We know you. I mean, look, at it, look right there. My God, they're saying, God, it's us, Israel. Don't, we're not the Phoenicians. We're not, we're not the Assyrians. This is us you're talking about. And God's going, I know exactly who you are. You know, I, I thought about so many movies that you've seen uh, in the storyline Somewhere it comes down to the fact that somewhere uh, there's been someone who has been treacherous against one of the main characters, and finally, you know, the guy's finally in handcuffs, and he's being led away, and he's yelling to his friend, this is me, man, what are you talking, why are you, and the guy is sitting there going, there you go, I know what you did, I know how you were unfaithful, I know how you deceived, I know how you were behind my back, and all of these things, while the other guy is being hauled off, and he's declaring his innocence. That's part of what we see happening right here. He's saying, to me they cry, my God, we, Israel, we know you. Well, if you go back and you look at chapter 4, verse 1, and then chapter 6, or in verse 6, and in chapter 5, verse 6, it's saying that you don't know me. You don't remember who I am. You don't know anything about me. You stop looking at my word. You stop teaching my word. You stop listening to my word. You stopped obeying my word to the fact that, to the point where you don't even know me. All that's being played out here as the judgment is coming. Look at verse three. Israel has spurned the good. The enemy shall pursue him. So they, they rebelled against the good. They, they fought it with contempt. And so the enemy, the judgment is coming. Look what else they did. Here's, here's more of the violation of the covenant from Leviticus and Deuteronomy. In verse 4, they made kings, but not through me. They set up princes, but I knew it not. With their silver and gold, they made idols for their own destruction. I have spurned your calf, O Samaria. Samaria, the representation of, of, of Israel was a calf. And so there's been calves found, uh, golden calves, all kinds of other things, uh, pottery calves, um, stone carvings um, that are there. That kind of their symbol was the calf. And so we see that he says, I've spurned your calf, O Samaria. My anger burns against them. How long will they be incapable of innocence? <laughs> I mean, that, that's like when you look at your kid and you're tempted to go, can't you do anything right? I mean, you say, oh, my parents have thought that before. Well, maybe when they're frustrated. I mean, we, we, we begin to see here, I mean, look at the end of verse 5. God is saying, how long are they going to be incapable of innocence? That means that they only do that which is evil. Look at verse four, look at verse six. For it is from Israel a craftsman made it, talking about the idols. It is not God. It is not God. You didn't make God. You think you made God. 
the calf of Samaria, what is going to happen? Are you all there? Look at verse 6. The calf of Samaria shall be broken to pieces. So then we go on and we see verse 7. For they sow the wind and they shall what? They're going to reap the whirlwind. The standing grain has no heads. That means that there's no, there's, no, there's no grain at the top of the wheat plant or the, uh, the barley or whatever it is. The, the, there, there's no grain at the top of the crop. It shall yield no flour. If it were to yield, the strangers would come devour it. So if anything does come out, it's going to get stolen because God's judgment is coming. And so we see the agricultural reference. We see the fact that God's going to destroy their idols. God's going to destroy their crops. Look at verse 8. Israel is swallowed up. Already they are among the nations as a useless vessel. That is so sad because they, God's plan was to use them. Look at verse 9. For they have gone up to Assyria... A wild donkey wandering alone. So they've gone up to help from pagan nations. Ephraim has hired lovers. They've gone and got mercenaries to help protect them. Verse 10, though they hire allies among the nations, I will soon gather them up. And the king and princes shall soon writhe because of the tribute. So here they go and they pay taxes to another king. They're making a deal instead of being God's people. And God is saying, they are going to writhe in pain because I am going to judge them for their unfaithfulness. Verse 11, because Ephraim has multiplied altars for sinning, they have become to him altars for sinning. And so here's the idea. Sin leads to more sin. So the the altars that were to be for sacrifice for sin in this regard now become the very place where they sin. This is a wickedness. This is a wickedness that, that turns what is to be the worship of God into a very corrupt worship of men. And, and, and I can just tell you that there are so many things like what Israel did that we do too. There are so many ways in which we can be tempted, even in this room as we worship, to ultimately turn the worship down to about what we want and aim it at ourselves. Now, I'm not just talking about music. I'm talking about church life. The whole picture is is that we remember that the king of heaven is the one that we are to bring glory to and the one that we are to live for and the one that we are to worship. And just like Israel, we can be guilty of turning to other gods and setting up altars that are supposed to be godly and use them for sin. Verse 12, while I write for him, my laws by the tens thousands, they will be regarded as a strange thing. It means they don't even pay attention to what God is saying. Verse 13, as for my sacrificial offerings, they sacrifice meat and eat it, but the Lord does not accept them. So here they are trying to offer these offerings to make things right with God, and God is saying, I reject your offerings. And that's exactly what he says in Leviticus and in Deuteronomy he would do. And so now in verse, middle of verse 13, he says, now he will remember their iniquity and punish their sins and they shall return to Egypt. The idea is they're going back to bondage. You know, remember when they were delivered from Pharaoh and they were given, I mean, here they are, miraculous, miracle, miraculous event after miraculous event. God brings them out of Egypt. God gives them into a land flowing with milk and honey. And yet they still turn to other gods and worship other gods. And so, he says, they're going back to bondage. Look at the end of verse 14. For Israel has forgotten his maker and built palaces. And Judah has multiplied fortified cities. So even the kingdom to the south, they're building all these fortified cities. They're seeking to do all these things in their own strength. So I will send a fire upon his cities, and it shall devour her strongholds. The picture is this, and just remember this as we look through all of chapter 8 and fill this in. Remember that God punishes them and destroys their plans precisely because he loves them. God is no doubt going to judge the wicked, and he pours out his wrath on the wicked because he does not love the wicked, but he does love those whom he will redeem and bring them back to himself. 
Now, some of you are turning the page, but don't do that yet. There's two key passages under here, Hebrews chapter 12 and Deuteronomy chapter 5. Remember this with me, and this is important for us to remember. For the Lord loves the one, excuse me, for the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastises every son he receives. And we see back in Deuteronomy. So know in your heart that just as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. It's important for that we begin to see that God in his mercy and his grace works not only in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament as he begins to show us his goodness in bringing us to that which is right. Now, I want you to notice on the right-hand side, there's also some key observations and applications for Hosea chapter 9. In Hosea chapter 9, notice these. Verses 1 through 6, their spiritual adultery is going to lead to exile. Exile means being kicked out of their land. And in verse 7, we're going to see that God's messenger, Hosea, is considered, fill it in, a lunatic. Remember what we said about lunatics? Those are the wild people that come out at night. They're looking at the, lo- they're looking at the moon. They're howling at the moon. They're, they're crazy. And so God's people begin to, or excuse me, the nation of Israel begins to say, Hosea is just crazy. And there's some contrasts that we're going to see in this. These are important. We see Israel's current rejoicing in their foolishness versus the coming devastation. I mean, it's, it's almost like the, the people at the VC government in France, before the Germans were going to invade, and before there, there was a whole group of officers that were saying, you know, the Germans are coming, the Germans are coming, and they're drinking and dancing and having a party, and they're ignoring the fact that the Germans are coming. And so that's kind of what we see with Israel, that God is saying through Hosea, judgment is coming, judgment is coming, and they're still dancing and drinking, acting like nothing's wrong. And so we see that there's this coming devastation. Notice number two, the prophet's message and guidance versus their own misguidance, and we'll see they're wandering. They're going to go wander around because they ignore God. They're going to go into desolation. And then look at number three. We're going to see all of God's blessings upon them versus the desolate consequences of their sins. So from a land flowing with milk and honey, from all of God's blessings, from being near to him and staying with him, we see that the judgment brings about great disaster. Now, I want you to see these, these, these themes, the fact that exile is coming, they reject um, Hosea, and then these contrasts. Look at verse 1. Rejoice not, O Israel, exult not like the peoples. You see, they're dancing in their foolishness. Rejoice not, O Israel, exult not like the peoples, for you have played the whore forsaking your God. You have loved a prostitute's wages on all threshing floors. Verse 2. Threshing floor and wine vat shall not feed them, and new wine shall fail them. They're going to be insatiable in this. They shall not remain in the land of the Lord. You see, they're getting kicked out. Hosea is saying, you guys are partying right now, but we're about to get kicked out of this land. God's judgment is coming. They will not, verse 3, they will not remain in the land of the Lord, but Ephraim shall return to Egypt, and they shall eat unclean food in Assyria. So they're not going to even be able to observe the Mosaic covenant. Look at the next part, verse 4. They shall not pour drink offerings of wine to the Lord, and their sacrifices shall not please him. It shall be like mourners' bread to them. All who eat of it shall be defiled. It's going to be really bad. For their bread shall be for their hunger only, and it shall not come to the house of the Lord. So they're going to have no opportunity to worship God as they are put into exile. This is part of their judgment. Verse 5, what will you do on the day of the appointed festival? This is when they're supposed to be worshiping God. And on the day of the feast of the Lord. For behold, they are going away from destruction, but Egypt shall gather them. Memphis shall bury them. Nettles shall possess their precious things of silver. Thorns shall be in their tents. So they're going into exile. They cannot worship. They will be cut off from God. 
Look at verse 7. The days of punishment have come. The days of recompense have come. Israel shall know it. The prophet, here it is, the prophet is a fool. The man of the spirit is mad. That Literally, they're a lunatic. Because of your great iniquity and great hatred. What they're saying, what, what Hosea is saying here is, you think I'm crazy because I have prophesied that judgment is coming and that we have left God. You don't listen. You know, friends, in this day and time, that happens all around us right now. When people stand and say, you know, there is a holy God. He made us. We did not make ourselves. No, I, I don't believe that the world just happened by, by chance. I don't believe that we, that we evolved out of some primordial, prim, prim, I can't even say it, primordial soup um, of mud and a lightning bolt strikes and suddenly there's life and, you know, on the backs of crystals comes life or, or some ridiculous thing. No, the scripture clearly says, I am the giver of life, God says. I have made you. You have not made yourselves. And so, to the world, that seems crazy. To the world, they reject the fact that, no, you can't just do whatever you want. You've been designed and you've been made to operate a certain way. And he has made the world into, to operate in a certain righteousness that is for his glory by his design. And when we come along and say, no, we can change all the rules. We can do what we want. And so you see that eventually they begin to say, you're crazy when we stand in the truth. Do you see this coming out? Look at verse 8. The prophet is the watchman of Ephraim with my God. Yet a fowler, this is a man who catches birds, yet a fowler's snare is on all his ways and hatred in the house of God. They have deeply corrupted themselves in the days of Gibeah. He will remember their iniquity. He will punish their sins. This is all right in line with what was promised in Leviticus and what was promised in Deuteronomy in the Mosaic law. Verse 10, and, and, and here we see the contrast of all of the blessings that God had given in verses what they wind up with. Like grapes in the wilderness, I found Israel like the first fruit on the fig tree in its first season, I saw your fathers. But they came to Baal Peor and consecrated themselves to this thing of shame. So they, tra they trade God for a, an idol and for detestable things and detestable behavior. And they became detestable like the thing that they loved. In fact, this is... Um, perhaps a phallic symbol that they are dancing around and worshiping in great uh, perversion. Verse 11, Ephraim, glory shall fly away like a bird. No birth, no pregnancy, no conception. So here comes the judgment, and that, these, are, these are some of the 27 judgments that are listed there. One of them is going to be infertility. One of them is going to be the inability to, to carry on family. In verse 12, if they bring up children, I will bereave them till none is left. Woe to them when I depart from them. Wow. Verse 13, Ephraim, as I have seen, was like a young palm planted in a meadow. So that, Ephraim, you had it. You were like this beautiful palm planted in a meadow. You were gonna, you, it was going to be beautiful. You were going to bear fruit. But Ephraim must lead his children out to slaughter. They're going to be wiped out. Give them, O Lord, what will you give them? Give them a miscarrying womb and dry breast. This is part of that great curse from the Mosaic law. Verse 15, every evil of theirs is in Gilgal, and there I began to hate them because of the wickedness of their deeds. I will drive them out of my house. I will love them no more. All their princes are rebels, so their leaders are leading them in the wrong way, and they're, it's because they're rebellious against God. In verse 16, Ephraim is stricken. Their root is dried up. They shall bear no fruit. Again, one of the curses from the Leviticus law even though they give birth, I will put their beloved children to death. You, this is so unbelievably serious. My God will reject them because they have not listened to him. And they shall be wanderers, underline this, they shall be wanderers among the nations. These were the people that were to be the come and see, come and see who God is. 
And now they are being cast out in this. My friends, when we see the law and when, listen, when we see the consequences of breaking God's law and the stark horror of the judgment of God against our disobedience, we should stand amazed at how unrighteous our hearts are and how seriously he takes our sin. And if we never study Hosea, if we don't ever look at the judgments of God against sin, then we can begin to think that God is passive about our sin. God is not passive about our sin. And, and my friends, we haven't even mentioned hell here. In New Testament talk, we, we often talk about the reality of total eternal condemnation from God. We're, we're not talking about hell. And, and of course, that's not a popular subject among many pulpits. But here in the context of Israel, we see all of this judgment. And it's like a hell on earth that they're being brought out. We need to recognize that there is massive consequence for sin, and in fact, that there is an inescapable consequence for sin, except for God's provision to see all of this judgment fulfilled in Christ. This is where it all winds up. All of the judgments, all of the horrors, all of the rejection is eventually poured out on Jesus so that we can escape the great judgment that would be to come. But we can't understand how big the cross is unless we see how serious our sin is. The cross will just be a trinket that maybe we wear around our neck or maybe a good luck charm as opposed to the real symbol of the grand and sacrificial nature of God. But one of the big takeaways from chapter 9 that we could take would come from chapter 7 or verse 7. And it's this. A big takeaway for Christians is this. Like Hosea, think about the prophet Hosea. Like him, Christians need to stand firm even when the message of God is not popular or well-received. No one was listening to Hosea. Everyone was saying he's crazy. He's mad. But you know what? He was the only one that was right. And they looked at him and thought, he's insane. In fact, he wasn't insane. In fact, he was indeed the one who had the words and the truth of God. And finally, we come to this last picture. And I want you to see the screen. This isn't on your outline. I just want you to see this. In chapter 10, it's the, it is also the continuation of the fact that the Lord will punish Israel. But there's a, there's a passage in this that, that talks about a calf, about a trained calf, a young calf that is trained. And in verse 11, we see this. This is on the screen. Just look at the screen. He has become this, this trained calf that, that used to do so well with God winds up being a stubborn animal that has to be harshly bridled. And, and we'll see this as we blow through this, this chapter. But notice this. Why? Why would this go this way? And it was because of her rebellion and her foolishness that God has to put bit and bridle, as so to speak, under a heavy yoke um, upon them. In this. So look with me and, uh, and just notice this in verse 1. Israel is a luxuriant vine that yields its fruit. The more his fruit increased, the more altars he built. So God is blessing them, and what do they do with the blessings? They wind up using it for other altars. As his country improved, he improves his pillars. So they're, ri they're raising up pillars of pagan worship. So that's what that is. Those are pillars of pagan worship around the land. Instead of exalting God, they're exalting the gods that are around them. And notice the next part in verse 2. Their heart is what? False. Be careful when, when you hear somebody say, you just got to trust your heart. You need to say, mm, I'm not sure about that. You see, your heart can deceive you. 
Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceitful and desperately sick. Who can know it? And so here we see their heart is false. Now they must bear their guilt. The Lord is going to break down their altars and destroy their pillars. You see, judgment, he's going to knock it all out. He's going to smash it. Verse 3, for they will say, we have no king, for we do not fear the Lord. And a king, what could he do for us? They utter mere words with empty oaths. They make covenants. So judgment springs up like poisonous weeds in the furrows of the field. So here we see this agricultural picture of a part of the judgment that is coming, whether it be specifically literal or even figurative. We begin to see that the whole nation is corrupted. In verse 5, the inhabitants of, Sam- of Samaria tremble. That's the, the capital of Israel in the north. For the calf of beth Aven, its people mourn for it, and so do its idolatrous priests. So they, they've raised up one of their calves, one of their idols, and they even mourn for it. They, they, they continue to feed after their idolatrous worship. Those who rejoice over it and over its glory, for it has departed from them. Verse 6, the thing itself shall be carried to Assyria as tribute to the great king. So God's going to haul off their golden calf and give it to Assyria. Ephraim shall be put to shame and Israel shall be ashamed of his idol. Verse 7, Samaria's king shall perish like a twig on the face of the waters. The high places of Avon, the sin of Israel, shall be destroyed. So these high places that they had raised on top of hills around in the, in the, in the various wildernesses and in the various countrysides, these high places, including the place of Avon, they are going to be destroyed. Thorn and thistle shall grow up on their altars, and they shall say to the mountains, cover us, and to the hills, fall on us. It's going to be so bad, they want their head to be smashed by the mountains. God's judgment. Look at verse 9. From the days of Gibeah you have sinned, O Israel, they have, but there they have continued. Shall not the war against the unjust overtake them in Gibeah? When I please, I will discipline them, and nations shall be gathered against them, and when they are bound up for their double iniquity. Verse 11, here it is. Ephraim was a trained calf that loved to thresh, And I spared her fair neck, but I will put Ephraim to the yoke. Judah must plow, Jacob must harrow for himself. So this picture of this this special place that they had of prosperity is being now harnessed, and they're going back under a heavy yoke of punishment. But then we come to verse 12. A passage that God gave me seven years ago as I prayed for Sheridan Hills, as I prayed for my own heart. I did not even at that time recognize all that was in Hosea. Look what it says. Sow for yourselves righteousness. Reap steadfast love. Break up your hardened ground. Fallow ground means hardened ground. Break up your hardened ground. Underline it. For it is time to seek the Lord that he may come and rain righteousness on you. In the midst of all this judgment, in the midst of all this sin, in the midst of all of this foolish, hardened heart, we see the prophet's message calling us to God, calling Israel to God, and we begin to see what God wants. Look in verse 13. You have plowed iniquity. You have reaped injustice. You have eaten the fruit of lies. 
Because you have trusted in your own way and in the multitude of your warriors, therefore the tumult or, the, or the, all of the destruction of war shall arise among your people, and all your fortresses shall be despo- destroyed. As Shalman destroyed Beth Arbel on the day of battle, mothers were dashed in pieces with their children. Thus it shall be done to you, O Bethel, because of your great evil. At dawn the king of Israel shall be utterly cut off. Church, we need to see that God is serious about sin. He is deathly serious about sin. Sin comes from within, but righteousness comes from God. And I want you to see that in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 19 through 23. We see this, this list from Galatians 5 that is, that is really like the Mosaic law list of sins repeated here in the New Testament. And we see the only hope for it. Look at verse 19. Now the works of the flesh, circle the word flesh, now the works of the flesh are evident. And here they are. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, ooh, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, that means hatred, strife, je- so conflict, jealousy. Here it is, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions. This long list, verse 21, envy, that's wanting what other people have. Envy, drunkenness, orgies. I don't have to explain that. And things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. By the way, fits of anger is in there. Ooh. Jealousy is in there. You see, it's the, it's the flesh, it's the breaking of God's law that is part of this great picture of our sinful state. But then look at verse 22. So that's the works of the flesh, but verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness gentleness, self-control, and then underline this, against such things there is no law. Why? Because they are righteous. Friends, it's only in the gift of God's Spirit that we can enjoy the righteousness that brings life and peace. The true gospel of Hosea is the true gospel of Jesus Christ, that he brings hope through his sacrifice in taking the wrath of God, in taking the judgment of God on the cross of Calvary. And it's through his great sacrifice that we can be, de- be declared righteous. You see, God's Spirit comes through the gift of God's Son. God's Spirit comes through the gift of God's Son. Only through Him can we live the abundant life that Jesus was talking about in John 10, 10. Don't fold your sheet. Look at Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. This is the key to the whole thing. The only hope that a Christian has against the violations of all of our flesh in the law is this. Paul would declare, I have been crucified with Christ. You see, Jesus died. It is no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. So every bit of wrath that God had planned against our sin was poured out upon Christ. And it's through the cross that there is hope against the sins of the heart that are seen not only in Hosea, but are seen in Galatians and that are seen throughout the Scripture. The great glory of God is found in the great call to His goodness and to His righteousness as found in Christ. This is our only hope. 
Now, Sheridan Hills, Hosea 8, 9, and 10 are giving us a vivid picture, as even the previous chapters, of our proneness to wander from God. And they're showing us the seriousness of our sin. May we allow God to convict us where we have minimized our sin, where we have minimized our wrongdoing, and even in doing so, where we have minimized the sacrifice of Christ on the cross of Calvary. Amen? Would you stand with me for prayer?